So for the past two years, I've studied more than I've studied in my entire life. At least one third of every day I spend studying. That equates to about 5,000 hours, which is over 200 full days of studying over the past two years. Now, if I'm spending this much of my time studying, I should maximize my efficiency during these times of studying. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about my favorite study techniques that help me study more efficiently and effectively. But before we get into that stuff, let's talk about my first ever sponsor for a video. Isn't that cool? I have a sponsored video. I never thought this would happen. Anyway, the sponsor of this video is Grammarly. Grammarly is an amazing digital writing assistant that I use every day. Grammarly has a free version with basic grammar and spelling suggestions, but upgrading to Grammarly Premium will save you much more time with their advanced features. These features allow you to feel confident that your writing is compelling and complete. It easily integrates into Chrome or whatever you use through a browser extension download. Now, a lot of times when I'm writing a blog post or writing a paper, I wanna find synonyms for my overused words and I can save time with Grammarly Premium's vocabulary suggestions to find more effective words that make my writing more compelling. Another great thing that Grammarly Premium has is you can save time proofreading and trying to meet the word count on your essay with Grammarly Premium's clarity suggestions, which remove unnecessary or redundant words. You can get your work done quickly and save time finding citations with Grammarly Premium's plagiarism detector to double check your work is your own across 16 billion other web pages. I personally use Grammarly all the time when I'm planning out these videos, writing web posts, or writing emails. Go to grammarly.com slash Zach to sign up for a free account today and get 20% off Grammarly Premium, help you save time and work more efficiently. As a quick prerequisite, the things you do before you studying is vital. My most popular video is that video and I'll link that kind of up here. But briefly, these are get a good night's sleep, exercise and have a good mindset. If you don't know me, my name is Zach and I'm a third year medical student in Philadelphia. So the first thing we're gonna talk about, which I do a lot of videos on, is the Pomodoro Method. So the Pomodoro Method is studying for a set amount of time and then taking a break for a set amount of time. This is a procrastination buster because it works the intimidating large amount of work you have to do into smaller, more manageable clumps. Also, it gives you set breaks for giving your mind and body a break for a certain amount of time. And what happens when you take these breaks is your mind resets and usually I find that I perform better after taking this nice little break. Because if you just work for something like three hours straight, probably all those three hours you're not gonna be working as effectively as powerfully as you could if you broke those into smaller chunks with integrated breaks. So what is the most common strategy? Well, the most common strategy, the strategy I normally use is 25 minutes of study, five minute break. 25 minutes of study, five minute break. 25 minutes of study, five minute break. 25 minutes of study, and then you take a 20 or 30 minute break. And then you can repeat these as many times as you want, but that's kind of one Pomodoro block. Another great thing about this strategy is that you can gamify, which research shows improves your performance. You can download apps like Forest, and what Forest does is for every certain amount of Pomodoro sessions you do, so say you do a 25 minute session, and you don't look at your phone, you don't get distracted, you don't step away from the focusing from the work, then you'll grow a little treat. And then as you keep focusing, as you keep working, you'll grow more and more trees and you can show off your little forest to other people and see who's got the biggest one. And this video isn't sponsored by Forest or anything like that. It's just an app I like. Personally, I like to try and complete about 10 Pomodoro sessions a day. Now, the most important thing about this method, the most important way to kind of maximize your gains from this method is during these sessions, you should only be studying. That's it. You're only studying during these Pomodoro sessions because there's a built-in break, right? There's a break that's coming right around the corner, which is when you can relax, when you can stop focusing. If you begin to slack off during these study times, during these focus times, it kind of reduces the mental strength of this partitioned time for studying. It reduces the conditioning you're building up for yourself that, okay, when I'm in this timer, when I'm in this session, I'm gonna work hard and I'm gonna focus. If you start to mess around during that session, it kind of defeats the whole purpose of the Pomodoro method. Save your slacking for those five minute breaks. What do you do during these breaks? This is a common question that people like to answer. Well, you can do anything you want. Personally, I think it's best to do something that doesn't include what you've just been doing. For a lot of us, right, that's gonna be looking at a computer or looking at a book and sitting. So what do we wanna do? We wanna not look at a computer or a screen or a book and we don't wanna be sitting. So what's the best thing to do is like go for a walk, walk outside, do something active that doesn't involve looking at a screen. My second favorite option is cleaning up your apartment. So I'll just like clean my desk area or clean my room or something like that. Or what you can do during this session is watch YouTube videos or browse the internet. Again, I don't think this is necessarily the best thing to do, but it's what I end up doing quite a bit. You can talk with friends or family, go get a snack or do some push-ups or bodyweight exercises. So what are the tools? What are the apps we can use to kind of 
implement this Pomodoro timer where you can get the forest timer, which I already talked about. You can get the bee focus timer, which is a Mac app, which is what I use. Or you can get this app called Self Control. And this is a great application because what it does is it restricts your access to the internet or certain parts of the internet. And no matter what you do, once you start that timer, you can't get there. Deleting the application, restarting your computer will not let you get to that part of the internet or that application. So some quick caveats to this method. Some people like to do the 50, 10 minute method. So you'll study for 50 minutes and then break for 10 minutes or some kind of other mashups. It doesn't really matter. It just equates to about every 10 minutes of work, you should take around a two minute break. So if you study for 60 minutes, maybe you take a 12 minute break. Finally, and the most important thing is this will only be an effective technique if you make it an effective technique. It'll only be effective if during this time you're studying and only studying. Bottom line is study in study break increments. This can be 25, five or 50, 10 or 60, 12 or whatever. Just study and then break, study and then break. Tip number two is the Feynman technique. And let's start this out with a quote. And this is a quote from Albert Einstein. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. Well, who is Richard Feynman? Well, Richard Feynman was a renowned physicist and teacher. Albert Einstein and Bill Gates were actually students of some of Feynman's lectures. And why were they students of this guy? Why were Albert Einstein and Bill Gates students of this guy? Well, he was such a good teacher. And the reason he was such a good teacher is he could explain extremely complex ideas in simple ways. The Feynman technique is exactly that. Can you explain some complex topic simply? Would a child understand you? Some people like to say it, imagine you're talking to a five-year-old. So here is me using the Feynman technique to explain the Feynman technique. First, identify the information. What are you trying to learn? Second, how would you teach it? Imagine explaining this information to a friend as simply as you can. Avoid jargon and prioritize brevity. Now, when you're doing this explanation, did you find anything tough to explain? Was there something that actually you didn't know how to explain in a simple way? Do a little more studying, rework this explanation until it's simple and you understand it. Then finally, try teaching it again. Let's use an example from the master himself when he explains inertia. If an object is left alone, is not disturbed, it continues to move with a constant velocity in a straight line as if it was originally moving. Now, if I was gonna try and use the Feynman technique to explain something like diabetes, I might do it something like this. So let's take a bowl of cereal, for example. Now, when someone eats a bowl of cereal, usually there is sugar in this bowl of cereal. And some of that sugar you'll use right away. Maybe you'll use it to walk and get up. Maybe you'll use it to do some thinking. You'll use it right away. But a lot of that sugar you won't actually need right away. So your body says, hmm, I might need some of this sugar later to go running or jumping or run away from a tiger. So I'm gonna store this sugar for later. That's where insulin comes in. Insulin allows you to kind of store this sugar, store this energy for later. And someone with diabetes, they may not be producing enough insulin or that insulin isn't working well enough. So what might happen with someone with diabetes is they'll eat this bowl of cereal, but they won't be able to store the sugar for later. And so someone with diabetes might not be able to access this stored sugar. And because they can't access this stored sugar, they can't access this stored energy, and so they get sick. Because this stored sugar, this stored energy is not only used for kind of moving our body and jumping and running away from tigers, but it's also used for our brain to work and our brain to do certain things. This is of course an extreme oversimplification of diabetes, but I hope it kind of made sense to someone who really knows nothing about diabetes. And that's the goal of the Feynman technique, that you can kind of take an seemingly very complicated topic like diabetes and kind of meld it down into something simpler that maybe a child would understand. The way to get the most out of this technique is to take it seriously and use it consistently. I like to imagine that I'm with one of my friends and they're actually asking me to explain it. And then I'm explaining it in front of other people. So if I mess up, I kind of get in trouble, right? Cause I don't want to explain something badly. It's actually kind of like making these YouTube videos, right? Because I have to explain certain things on these YouTube videos, but I have to avoid jargon and I need to make the explanation brief so people don't lose focus. So I'm actually learning quite a bit about these things when I'm making these videos, which is one of the reasons I love making these YouTube videos anyway. So what tools can you use for this? Well, one great tool is your phone. You can call a friend, you can call someone and just try and explain a topic to them. So bottom line, try and imagine explaining what you just learned to a child or someone who knows nothing about the topic. So technique number three is a not to do something. And I've made an entire video about this before, and I'll link that somewhere in this kind of general area, but you want to avoid rereading, highlighting, and summarizing. Evidence shows that rereading, highlighting, and summarizing are poor techniques when compared to other studying techniques. So what tools might you need for this? Well, a good tool would maybe have a furnace for your highlighters. 
study technique number four is what I just talked about is use practice testing and use active recall. Practice testing and active recall are kind of two of my favorite three pillars of studying. So what are these two things? Well, practice testing is exactly that. It's taking practice tests. And these can be practice questions from your teachers, practice questions online, anything like that. And active recall is when you have to work to recall something. So when I ask you, what is two plus two, you kind of figure out in your head, okay, it's four. Even though it's a little bit of work, it's still work. And that work is active recall. Now say instead I put on the screen across here, two plus two equals four. Now all you're doing right now is you're just reading that two plus two equals four. Sure, there's a little bit of work in reading it, but you're not having to do any processes. You're not having to do any kind of working in your mind because it's already given. Two plus two equals four is already given. You don't have to think about, okay, two plus two equals four and then you get four. The brain is working harder and you are learning more from what does two plus two equal than reading two plus two equals four. When you are doing a tough problem, you feel your brain working, right? When you're doing a tough test, you feel it working. But when you're just reading or when you're just watching this video like this, it's not as much work and you can probably feel that for yourself. Isn't watching this video easier than the homework assignment you did or the test you did or the essay you kind of wrote three words and then clicked on the YouTube video? Probably is. So what are some tools you can use to implement active recall and practice testing? Well, you can use practice tests from your teacher or from the internet. You can use Anki for flashcards. I also have a video on like my nine day study plan before tests, which I'll link in this area, but this integrates active recall, practice testing and spaced repetition. So bottom line, use active recall and practice testing as much as you can when studying. I don't think it's possible for me to go a single video without mentioning Anki, so I won't. Just as every action has an equal and opposite reaction, I will talk about Anki. But all spaced repetition is, is exactly that. You're focusing on learning things at different time intervals. So if you review topic A on Monday, maybe you'll review it again on Tuesday, and then maybe you'll review it again on Thursday. And Anki is a great way to use this because it applies these spacing intervals that have been worked out by very smart people, and also it does it all for you. And you can do flashcards and all kind of good stuff. So so now just take this space repetition technique and apply it to everything you learn. Seriously, apply it to everything you learn. It's what the evidence supports, it's what top performing students at my medical school do, and it's what I do. So bottom line, use Anki or other things to integrate space repetition to everything you learn. Tip number six is make connections. And I'm gonna reference something called Hebbian theory here. Theory is that the more connections we make to a piece of information, the more likely we are to retain that information over time. Now, this isn't an exact science. It's not a proven thing, it's a theory. The more we can connect our memories and connect ideas, the more likely we are to retain that information for a longer period of time. So how do we take advantage of this? Well, what I like to do is whenever I'm learning something specifically on a flashcard or something like that, I try to make connections between other topics that I've been learning. And that's linking these two topics, making me learn it better, and hopefully, if we believe in Hebbian theory, making this information stick longer. Now, this method could also be called chunking, but I'll go into that a little bit later. Bottom line is make connections between facts and information in your brain because it might help this information stick around longer. So technique number seven is planning. For me, planning removes stress from the next day, provides actionable goals, and lets me accomplish more when I'm working. It also importantly allows me to jump right into working as soon as I wake up, instead of kind of figuring out, okay, what am I gonna do, what's important? And in general, the more specific your tasks, the more specific your goals, the better. So for example, if you wanna study biology, a better thing than saying study biology is, oh, I wanna study chapters two and three of biology today. Oh, I wanna do 20 practice questions and I wanna do 100 flashcards. And I take it a step further by planning out my entire week on Sunday in an app called Notability. And what I'll do is I'll say, okay, I know I have these certain things, these certain plans that I think, these certain things that I have to do Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Now I'm gonna write down those things and I'm also gonna write what I would like to get accomplished on those individual days. Personal and life events, I like to use a handwritten notebook or a calendar or an app called Notion, which I will be making a video in the future of kind of everything I do and how I use Notion, cause I love it. Bottom line, try planning out your weeks the week before and try planning out your days the day before. This will reduce stress and kind of allow you to more easily jump into what you need to get done that day or that week. Finally, study technique number eight are mnemonic devices. And I'm going to include a jumble of different techniques that you can use that I use all the time. But these are kind of smaller things, so I didn't think they needed individual subcategories. The specific tools I use and the specific tools I mention are actually the techniques and strategies used by the memory champions of the world. If you don't know, there are memory competitions where people have to memorize like decks of cards in certain orders or as many numbers as they can in order, it's crazy. 
but what they use is these memory techniques. So the first thing we're gonna talk about are memory palaces or imagery. This is why Sketchy or Picmonic are such popular resources in medical school because they use this amazing imagery, this amazing memory technique, memory strategy for remembering information. And one way to do this is a memory palace. So in my apartment right now, right, I can picture kind of the kitchen area, I can picture my bedroom, and I can picture my bathroom. So maybe if I don't want to remember certain topics or certain concepts, I can attach certain images or these concepts to different parts of this room. So maybe if I wanted to remember a printer, a soccer ball, and an apple, and I wanted to remember those three objects in order or something like that. Okay, then I do the printer first in the kitchen, the soccer ball in my bedroom, and the apple in the bathroom. But that's not enough. You need to make it real. You need to make as integrate as many senses as you possibly can. Usually the sillier, the crazier they are, the better. So maybe I'll picture that my printer is sitting on the stove on fire as I walk through the apartment. And then in my bedroom, the soccer ball has replaced my pillow. So now I have to sleep on a soccer ball when I go to bed. And when I go to the bathroom, when you think of a bathroom, I think of a toilet. So in the toilet inside is an apple. That's kind of weird. Why is an apple in the toilet? So now when I walk through my, me my memory palace of my apartment in my head, I'll be like, oh boy, the printer's on fire on the stove. Printer. Oh, there's a soccer ball instead of my pillow? Why, why is that there? Soccer ball. And then I'll walk into the bathroom in my head and I'll see the apple inside the toilet and I'll see, that's kind of weird. Why is an apple in a toilet? Apple. Importantly, this doesn't work with concepts. It only works with specific pieces of information. It's a memorization technique. This is why sketchy and other kind of medical school things work so well for remembering specific facts about bacteria and things like that. Because for example, one thing you might need to know is whether a bacteria is gram positive or negative. And what they do in the image, ingeniously so, is they just make the image purple if it's gram positive or like more red if it's gram negative. The next mnemonic technique is acronyms. One acronym I don't think I'll ever forget is Roy G. Biv, and these are just the wavelengths of the visible colors of light. So R is red and this is the lowest wavelength and V is violet and this is the highest wavelength. And all an acronym is, is just using the first letter of a set of words or a, or a couple words to remember certain information. Next, there's something called acrostics. And acrostics is similar to acronyms, except it uses the first letter of a set of words to remember something. Just to make this medical oriented, the one medical acrostic that I remember from medical school is some anatomists like effing over poor medical students. And these are just branches of the external carotid artery. Finally, we have chunking and chunking is exactly that. It's just chunking information into more manageable block. What do you think is an easier way to remember these random 10 numbers? Two, three, four, four, eight, three, oh, nine, eight, oh, or two, three, four, 483-0980. It's easier to do the chunking. But that's it. Those are eight techniques that I've used consistently in the past two years of medical school and I've kind of learned over the past nine years of higher education that have helped me immensely with my performance and understanding and retaining information. That is it. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.